Let me just say a few things as introduction to this. That you know there's multiple ways that you can receive a healing from God. And I hadn't got time to teach on all this. I'm just going to say this briefly. But you can receive an instantaneous manifestation. That's what most people want and expect. And I believe that, that we certainly can receive instantaneous manifestations. But then you can also lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That just means that from that time on, the sickness or the disease or the injury is recovering. And there is no bad way to receive and so uh, don't get so fixed on one thing that you won't receive, you know, in case it's just you start your healing this week. And uh, we could expound on that a lot. I minister primarily on how you can believe and receive healing. Now, there are other ways to receive. And that's the reason that we invited Benny Hinn. And Benny Hinn will be here on Friday and Saturday, and Benny Hinn operates in a gift of miracles and the gifts of healings. And that's different than just standing and believing for a healing. And again, there is no bad way to receive a healing. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm more uh, prone to minister on how to just believe and receive a healing because that's my teaching gift is to be a teacher. But, uh, you know, some people just aren't going to receive that way. And I'm not saying that that's the way it should be, but I'm saying that's the way that it is. Some people may have a death sentence on them. And if the only way for you to receive is just to start learning the word and build your faith and learn how to take your authority and speak, if that was the only way you could receive, some of you would die before you were able to grow and do that. And so because of that, God has special gifts that he's given to the body of Christ, like Benny Hinn, who operates in a gift of miracles. But, you know, I, I used to usher in Catherine Kuhlman's meetings back when I was uh, real young. And uh, I saw great miracles happen, but I was one of the ushers. And we would have an invalid section where there would be 50 or 100 people that were completely paralyzed and invalid. And out of those 50 or 100 people, we might see two or three people heal. And that's great. And I mean, they were one lady I actually had to take out of her stretcher. She was on a stretcher and I had to put her in a seat because we had to clear the aisles for uh, fire code. And I mean, this woman didn't weigh 60 pounds and I could put my hand around her thigh. She was like a Holocaust victim. And yet that woman, uh, I, after I ushered, I went down and I was sitting on the floor right in front of Catherine Kuhlman wanting to see what was going on. And pretty soon this woman comes running down the aisle that was on the stretcher and jumps up on the stage totally ill. And that was awesome. That's a miracle. But you know what? There was only two or three people out of 50 or 100 people that were healed that way. And so again, uh, praise God for any way you receive a healing. But I'm kind of... Uh, prejudice are, are prone to minister about how you can receive a healing because, you know, Benny Hinn's not always here. Catherine kuhlman has gone on to be with the Lord now. We don't have people like that. It, you can't just follow people around from meeting to meeting. Now, we're going to have Benny Hinn here, and I believe there's things that will happen that will happen through his ministry that won't happen just through my ministry. You know, we had Todd White here in 2019, I think it was, and uh, Todd White... We had seen, I think it was Carly that was ministering and, and uh, had people stand up. And we saw over a thousand people who manifested a physical healing. And it was awesome. But did you know the last night when Todd White was here, we had a man, an elderly man that came up carrying his wife in his arms. And she walked right up. He walked right up here and and held his wife and he was elderly himself and he could barely hold her. I got up behind him and helped hold his arms up and Todd started ministering to this lady and she couldn't hold her head up, couldn't raise her hand, couldn't do anything. And after Todd prayed for her, then uh, he says, do something you couldn't do. And she raised her hand. She couldn't have done that. And within just a few minutes, she was sitting up and she came back a few months later and walked up to the top of the balcony and sat up there. Praise God. But that was after we had seen over a thousand people just receive their healing directly from the Lord. There was uh, this couple that had been here the entire time and hadn't seen the healing. I don't understand everything about healing, but one thing I do know is that God wants you well. And God is going to do everything he can to get you well. 
this week. He wants you well more than you want to be well. It's alive the devil that God only heals some people. I still don't understand everything. Most of it is our own problems. We get so full of religious teachings such as that God wants you to suffer, that this is punishment. Those kind of things will hinder healing in your life. Uh, believing that God can do it, but that he hasn't done it, that you have no control over it. You just have to hope and pray, but you don't have any authority over it. I'm going to be talking about that this morning. Those kind of thinkings will hinder you from receiving a healing. But I can promise you, God wants you well more than you want to be well. Jesus is the perfect example of what God is like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I am the express image of the Father. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He's the express image. And that word means a perfect representation. Jesus said, whatever I see my Father doing is what I do. And yet you never see Jesus putting sickness on a single person. You never see Jesus telling a person you hadn't prayed enough. You hadn't fasted enough. Did you know all of the people that Jesus ministered to were messes? It's a, it's a mistaken idea that you have to have your whole act together and have everything right before God will move in your life. But religious tradition and doctrines of men, Mark chapter 7 verse 13 says it makes the word of God of none effect. And we have a lot of stinking thinking that hinders us from receiving. It's like a pipe is clogged up and full of all of this stuff. And the, the water is there, but it can't get through because of all of this stuff that's blocking the flow. So it's not your sin. It's not your lack of being holy. It's not any of these things. It's just stinking thinking, wrong attitudes that really hinder the supernatural power of God. But uh, I'm not going to teach on all of that. I'm, I'm mentioning it. But let me just summarize it by saying Acts 10, 38 Peter was preaching the gospel to Cornelius and he summarized the life of minis and ministry of Jesus. And he said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That one verse is just powerful. Jesus went about doing good. Some people will think that healing, supernatural healing is of the devil. They'll call people faith healers. And they'll criticize faith healer. Well, what's wrong with getting healed by faith? Amen. But there's people that say that this is the devil. They'll say that getting healed is of the devil, but being sick is of God. That's completely opposite of what the Bible teaches. Mark, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 lists the blessings of keeping the law, which of course nobody could ever keep the law, but through Jesus, we get those blessings through his faithfulness, not through ours. And one of those blessings is to be healed and healthy. And then verses 16, 15 through 68 of Deuteronomy 28 is talking about the curses of the law. And in there is listed all of these sicknesses and diseases, the botch, the mildew, emrods. I don't even know what an emrod is, but it's not good. <laughs> Amen. And it, the Bible lists sickness as a curse and health as a blessing. And there are instances in the Bible where God smote people with sickness, but it wasn't a blessing. It was always a curse. And Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith. Christ redeemed us from the curse. Don't let what happened to somebody as a curse stop you from receiving the blessing of healing because Jesus went about doing good and healing all, not some, but all. Every single person, every person was healed. And notice also it says that they were oppressed of the devil, not of God. God is not the one who has brought sickness on you. God is not the one who has distanced himself from you and you're crying and pleading for healing and he doesn't care and he hasn't heard. The Lord wants to get healing to you more than you want to receive it. So you got to get rid of all of this stinking thinking that would pl plug up the pipes and keep the power of God from flowing through you. And so we're going to be ministering to you and we've got many different people that will be ministering to you this week. Uh, we're going to come at it from every direction. Every one of us, we still believe the same thing, but it's just a different perspective. And, and some of you will relate more to one person than another. 
But uh, I tell you, I believe we are going to see thousands of people. I'm believing that this will be the meeting where we see all people, every single person. Amen. Man, that's awesome. Amen. So I've got a lot I want to share. I've only got two times I think I'm ministering to you, and I've already taken up 20 minutes of my time here today. So let me turn over to Exodus chapter 4, and I just want to start here and share something with you quickly. I was just reading this uh, yesterday and today. I've been reading in Exodus. And Exodus chapter 4 is one of those passages that the Lord touched my life in 1973 through this passage. And I probably have maybe a dozen of my teachings based on the life of Moses right here. I hadn't got time to go through all of that. But I just wanted to point out in Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 3 is where the Lord appeared unto Moses in a burning bush and told him four different times. He says, now I've heard the groanings of my people. I'm sending you to deliver them. And Moses said, God, they won't listen to me. God, who am I? Man, I wish I had time to put this. I'm, I need to let that go. That's awesome. <laughs> and anyway, finally, the Lord said to him, what do you have in your hand? It's in Exodus chapter four, verse two. And he said, a rod. It was just a stick that he had fashioned into a rod. And it was like the tool of his trade. It's how he fought off animals that were affecting his sheep. It's how he herded sheep. He used it to stabilize himself, maybe walking up a hill or something like that. It was a tool of his trade. And it was just a stick. And the Lord said, cast it on the ground. And, it be and he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And again, I've probably got five hours worth of teaching on that verse. Let me just say quickly that you have to take whatever it is that you use. This was his tool of his trade. It was like a part of him. It was something that he relied on. He leaned on and he took it and God said, throw it down before me. And so this is surrender. And he had been in Bush University for 40 years. He had tried to bring deliverance to the Jews his own way. I know many of you get your theology more from the movie, The Ten Commandments, than you do from the Bible. And I like that movie. I've watched it a number of times. But Moses, it says in Acts chapter 7, knew that he was the deliverer and that he, when he killed the Egyptian, he supposed that his brothers would have understood how that God by his hand was going to deliver him. But they understood not. He wasn't just a nice guy that killed this Egyptian. He was trying to use his position, his authority as second or third in control of Egypt to bring deliverance to the Jews. And it made perfect sense, but the only thing wrong with it was it wasn't the way God was going to do it. And it was 10 years premature to the prophecy of Genesis chapter 15, where it says they'd be there for 400 years. It was only the 390th year, and you can't rush God. You aren't going to microwave your miracle. And so anyway, he was, he had his timing off and he thought God was going to use him, but he totally messed the thing up, had to flee from Egypt and spent 40 years in Bush University learning, God, I'll do it your way next time. Give me another chance. I'll do anything. Hebrews chapter 11 said he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He wasn't there running from God as the movie, The Ten Commandments show. He was holding on to God and believing that God was still going to use him to bring deliverance. And finally, here he is. God's manifesting himself. He's in the presence of God. God says, uh, here's his uh, final exam in Bush University. He says, Moses, throw your rod down. And so he threw it down. It turned into a snake and he fled from before it. And then in verse 4 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. Did you know Moses didn't have the benefit of knowing what the last part of that fourth verse said? He hadn't written it yet. From Moses' perspective, when you take up a serpent by the tail, that means you aren't in control anymore. That means that serpent can turn and bite you. This was like a death sentence. Moses, 40 years before, just got a word from God that God is going to use you to deliver the Israelites. And he says, oh, thank you, God. I can understand perfect wisdom. 
Man, I was supernaturally saved from death when all the other male children were killed. I was raised in Pharaoh's house. I'm second or third in command. There's secular accounts that Moses went and conquered the Lubiums and brought in the greatest amount of spice and treasure that Egypt ever had. He was a military giant. It made perfect sense for God to choose him. But see, God wasn't going to use him based on his personal thing. It, you have to come to the end of yourself before you really begin to experience the supernatural power of God. And people that are super talented and super motivated, it's hard for them to let go of trusting in themselves. People that don't have a lot going for them, it's easy for them to yield to God because they just hadn't got a chance unless God comes through. That's the reason that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. And so anyway, here was his final exam. Moses, are you going to rely on me? Will you do anything? You've said you'd do anything. Pick it up by the tail. And from Moses' perspective, this could have been death. But he had learned that I'd rather die doing what God tells me to do than to live under my own strength and my own wisdom. So he picked it up by the tail, and when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into a rod. And to anybody who looked at it, like if we would have been there and if he had told us this story that, you know, man, I threw this down and it turned into a snake. And if people would have thought, let me test this, and if they'd have taken a chip off of that, sent it in for analysis, it still would have been whatever kind of wood it was. People would have thought there's nothing to it because they weren't there when he had this encounter with the Lord. But he threw his life down, picked it up by the tail, and looked down in verse 20. This is just absolutely awesome. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 20, And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. In verse 2, God says, What is it? He says, It's a rod. It's a stick. It was Moses' stick. If Moses would have hit a rock, it would have either broken the rod or it would have jarred Moses. But it had no power in it. It was just a stick. But when he threw it down and yielded it to God and then picked it up by the tail, which meant that he wasn't in charge, all of a sudden now it's the rod of God. It's God's stick. And it can do anything that God wants to do. And the reason I'm bringing this out is to say that this is what you have to do. It's what we actually did when we got born again. We turned our life over to the Lord and God gives it back to us. But it's really not our life anymore. You need to get to a place like Paul. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. And that's the way we have to be, that this is God's life. And when you got born again, God gave you his power and his authority. Just for time's sake, I got a lot I'm trying to cram into here. I'm just going to refer to this. But in the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, after Moses had already brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and he held his rod out over the Nile and it turned to blood. He held his rod out over the land and lice came up and flies came up. He held his rod up to the sky and hail came out of a clear sky and fire ran along upon the ground. He caused it to be dark for three days and yet there was light, sunlight, not just artificial light, sunlight in the houses of the, of the Israelis while it was totally dark for three days in the land of Egypt. He did all of these plagues. He did all of these great things. And as they came out of the land of Egypt, the Lord told them in the 14th chapter to encamp in a certain place where the Red Sea was on one side and two mountains on the other side, like a box canyon, there was no escape. The Lord was setting a trap for Pharaoh and he says, I am going to be glorified on Pharaoh and on all of his hosts. So he told Moses what would happen. I'm setting a trap and Pharaoh's going to come out and think you're entangled in the land and he's going to come out and try and kill you. So he told Moses what was going to happen. So Moses obeyed. And sure enough, here come the Egyptians. And when the Israelites saw the Egyptians, they began to complain. They said, let's make a captain and go back to Egypt and serve them as slaves. It'd be better to live as slaves in Egypt and be alive than to get killed here. And they formed a rebellion. And in the 14th chapter, I think it's around verse 12 or 13, Moses said, fear not, uh, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
Which sounds like a great statement, but did you know the very next verse, the Lord said unto Moses, why are you crying unto me? Command the people to go forward. He didn't tell them to stand still. And he says, why are you crying unto me? Moses could have looked at Pharaoh's thousands of soldiers and he says, well, here's a thousand reasons why I'm crying out unto you. But see, you know what God told him? He says, take the rod. It was Moses' rod in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. But now it was the rod of God and it had done all these miracles. He says, you take that rod. You use the power and the authority that I've given you and you hold it out over the sea and you tell the people to go forward. That's huge. And this is what's happening to the vast majority of the body of Christ. They are coming to God as a beggar. And they'll say things like, God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing, but I believe that you can do all things. Would you stretch forth your hand? Would you heal me? Would you move in my life? Did you know God rebuked Moses for that? and said, use what you've got. I gave you my rod. You have power and authority. And if he hadn't have taken, if he hadn't have got up off of his face, and if he hadn't have used what God had given him and parted the sea, then I believe that the Egyptians could have come down and wiped them all out. He had to use the authority and power. And I've got a lot of things about how God applied this in my life. I want to turn over to Mark chapter 11 and give you a New Testament example where Jesus operated in this exact same thing. But in the 11th chapter of the book of Mark, Jesus and his disciples were going into the city of Jerusalem. This is just a couple of days before his crucifixion. And it says in verse 12, and on the morrow when they were come to, from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for the time of figs was not yet. Some people wonder why he cursed the tree if it wasn't time for it to have figs yet. It wasn't time for it to have figs, but it wasn't time for it to have leaves either. I've had some people challenge me on this and we actually contacted the Israeli embassy. And I guess there's different types of fig trees, but in Israel, fig trees produce figs before they produce leaves. If they have leaves, they should have figs. It wasn't time for figs yet, but it wasn't time for leaves. This fig tree was a pervert. <laughs> God created this tree, and he's the one that created that it produced figs before it produced leaves. It was a hypocrite. It was professing that it had something that it didn't have. And as creator, he had every right to curse that fig tree because it was professing something it didn't possess. And so it says in verse 14, and Jesus answered. Notice he answered. The fig tree didn't talk in words, but the fig tree proclaimed or professed something that it didn't possess. So it had spoken to him. Did you know things will talk to you? Your checkbook will talk to you. Your body will talk to you without ever saying a word. Your body will tell you that you're sick. You'll, your fears will talk to you. you got uh, genetic disease that runs in the family and that you start thinking all of these things. You don't always have to have words. Things will talk to you. Anything that talks to you, you need to talk back to it. Amen. And so Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Then they went into Jerusalem. He cast the money changers out of the temple. This was the second time he did it. He did it at the first of his ministry and he had to repeat a sermon and cast the money changers out again three years later. And, and then, then the next morning, and they went back into Bethany that night. The next morning as they were going back into Jerusalem, it says in verse 29, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. If you read this in Matthew's account, it says that it died immediately. And yet they didn't notice it until 24 hours later. And I believe the reason is because it says it dried up from the roots. Man, this is something, I have a limited time, but this is something that we could stay on for a long period of time. There's people that when they pray and ask for a healing, they just immediately look in the physical to see if the problem has changed and if they can't see it or feel it or they go to a doctor and they want the doctor to verify that they're healed. And again, if that's what the God, Lord tells you to do, it's fine. But I'm saying there's some people that won't believe that anything has happened until they can see it. 
And yet this says, if you compare it with Matthew, it died immediately, but there was no visible results. It was the next day before you could see that the fig tree was dead. Why? Because it died from the roots. It was dead the moment that God spoke to it. The moment that Jesus spoke to this fig tree, it was dead. Again, this is something that we, I'm sure that other speakers will magnify on this. But the moment you believe, you're healed. And it may take a period of time for what you feel in your body or see to change, but that's incidental. You know, when you cut a rose off from the uh, bush, that thing will still look like it's good for a while. You can put it in water and put sugar in it or something like that, and you can extend the life of it for a period of time. But the moment it's severed from that bush, it's dead. And the moment you believe your sickness is dead, it just is a matter of time until your body recovers and that thing that was destroying you is gone. This fig tree died immediately, but it was below the surface in ways that you couldn't see or perceive. It took a while before the physical manifestation came. And so uh, when his disciples saw it, it says, And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. You know, we don't have the benefit of knowing or hearing the inflection of people's voice. But I can guarantee you, Peter didn't just go, Master, the fig tree's withered away. <laughs> it was like when he saw it, it was more like, Wow, the fig tree is, is withered away. It's dead. You didn't touch it. You didn't pour salt on it. You didn't do anything. You just talked to it. And that fig tree obeyed you. He was shocked. And, and then Jesus said, have faith in God. I don't believe he said, have faith in God. <laughs> it was more like, have faith in God. What's wrong with you? There's a reason that I called you disciples. <laughs> you guys are dumber than a bag of rocks. They were shocked to see that Jesus could just talk to something and it would be healed. And so he explained how it happened in verse 23. He says, for verily, the word, anytime Jesus said something, it's always true. But for him to say verily, that means he's telling you, I'm saying the truth. I'm telling you the truth. This is important. You need to listen. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, whosoever means Whosoever, that means any person who is fighting anything in your body, if you are a whosoever, anybody, here's how you get that power manifest. Whosoever will say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Man, there's a lot in this verse. Let me just point out some things. And again, we'll be amplifying on this this week. But one of the things he's talking about is that faith is voice activated. Whosoever will say. He said three times in this verse, you have to say to your mountain. Boy, this is a huge deal. I may minister on this more later in the week. But he didn't say talk to God about your mountain. He said, whoever will talk to the mountain and speak to the mountain in the name of the Lord. Yeah, right. This is really, really, really important. And again, most people see come to the Lord and say, oh God, we know that you can do anything. Yeah. They don't say it, but they say you haven't done anything, but you could do it. And so we ask you to stretch forth your hand, but oh God, we have no power. I have people come to me all the time and tell me how pitiful their situation is. And they tell me every pain and everything, trying to uh, draw sympathy out of me to increase my desire to minister to them. Like they've got to, they've got to make themselves just pitiful. The moment you identify, the moment you approach God that way, you have shot yourself in the foot. You have killed your own healing. Because you are denying that you have power and authority. For Jesus to say, for you to speak unto the mountain, it implies that you understand that God's already done his part. You don't have to go to God and ask for healing. It's already provided. You got to take your authority. You got to pick up that rod and hold it out and say that, God, I've got your power and authority. In myself, I may be nobody. 
I may not be anybody special, but in Christ, I am a new creation. I've got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. And how do you release it? Well, first of all, you need to quit asking God to do what he's already done. By his stripes you were healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. It's already done. And this raising from the dead power is put on the inside of you. And if you will activate it with your words, take your authority and speak to your problem. God's not your problem. Your problem is your sickness. It's your cancer. It's your pain. It's your whatever it is that you're dealing with. You talk to your body. You take authority and say, body in the name of Jesus, I command you to respond. You speak to your pain and say, pain, I command you to leave. And again, some people think this is weird, talking to pain. It's what Jesus said. Whosoever will say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith will come to pass, then whatsoever he says, it'll come to pass. You can either say what you have and reinforce it and stay stuck, or you can start saying what you believe to come to pass, and it will come to pass if you don't doubt in your heart. But many people, somebody will come to them and say, how are you? And they, they're sorry they asked, because you're going to tell them every doctor's report. You're going to give them every pain. You're going to talk about everything. You're going to talk about it so bad. I'm going to die. I know for sure. And, and you just are speaking death. You're hung by your tongue. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of your tongue. I had a man come up to me at our Healing is Here conference a few years back. And he says, I know everything you're saying and I know it's true, but I just don't have any power. And I looked at him and I said, right here is your power. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. If you can talk, you've got power. Whosoever will say unto this mountain. You got to start using your words. Curse that tree at the root. Curse that sickness at the root. Speak to cancer and say, cancer cells in the name of Jesus, I command you to die. You cannot reproduce in my body. Pain, I command you to be gone and whatever the source of this pain is. Talk to it instead of talking to God about your problem. Talk to your problem about God. Take your authority and you begin to speak. And if you would do that, it will obey you. Al and Angie Burke down here, they're on our television program and they're going to be speaking uh, this week. And Al fell and hurt himself. And <laughs> anyway, they'll, I'll let them give their own testimony. But he spoke and acted on the word of God and walks perfectly well today. And on and on you could go giving testimonies. I'm telling you, this is one of the keys is that instead of you coming to God and, oh God, I am nothing, I have nothing, I can do nothing, you need to take up that rod by the tail. You need to say that, Father, you gave me back my life and to other people, I may look like just a hick from Texas or whoever you are, and I may not be special, but inside, if you could see me inside, I am absolutely awesome. And I have the life of God and I've got the authority of God. And if I'll speak in faith, Satan will flee from me. He was, uh, Jesus went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil, sicknesses of the devil. So many people just think it's only physical. It's only natural. There are some things that are physical and natural. But did you know about half of the healings that Jesus performed? were where he cast devils out of people. Blindness was, deaf, uh, was a devil. Dumbness was a devil. Deafness was a devil. Curvature of the spine was a devil. Uh, a, an issue of blood. Uh, it says that she was bound by the devil, a woman with the issue of blood. Half of the healings that Jesus produced were, were demons being cast out. And I tell you, you need to quit just accepting things as natural. And take your authority and rebuke the devil and fight it. I hate sickness. I don't believe in getting sick. I don't get sick. I've had some things happen to me. I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want you to come up and impose your unbelief on me. 
that I had some things happen a year ago that I guarantee you uh, could have killed me. And if I'd have gone to a doctor, it'd have been serious surgery and I'd have been in bad shape. And you know what? I spoke to it and I've talked to it and I am back and I'm walking in health and stuff and I overcame it without anything. I'm not against doctors, but as I heard on Benny Hinn's little clip that they play on my television program announcing him being here, he said he's not against doctors, but he's against the Lord being second to a doctor. If it wasn't for doctors, all the Christians would be dead because they hadn't known how to believe God. So I'm not against doctors, but I tell you what, there's nothing a doctor can do for me that Jesus can't do better, cheaper, and quicker. And so I didn't go to a doctor and I just believed God and I am supernaturally healthy. Amen. Amen. And it's the things that I'm talking about right here. I spoke to myself every day for the last year. These things that I damaged and stuff, I've spoken and praise God, I'm walking in health and you can walk in health. So we are here to help you. And this is just a brief introduction today. But I'm telling you, don't come here just, oh God, I'm desperate. You know, I like the tune of that song, I'm desperate for you, but I hate the words. The words desperate, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means without hope. I'm never without hope. I am not desperate. I'm in need of some things, but I'm never desperate because man, God is in my life and he's taught me things and I'm speaking and taking my authority and I'm walking things out. And I've seen supernatural miracles. I've got doctor's reports of being healed of incurable diseases. I've seen my son raised from the dead after he was dead for over four hours, between four and five hours, and he came back to life. He's the one that puts up this screen and does all this. He works for me. And he's alive from the dead. I saw my wife raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open. We had a little baby that was placed right here in this exact spot. In, in either 2018 or 2019, a 14-month-old baby that was dead, and Carly took it, and Daniel, and they were holding, and I was standing right here, but they were the ones holding this little baby, and this little baby was raised from the dead in front of all of us right here. I just came from a meeting with Jim Baker this last week, and he was talking, long story, but he was talking about how he prayed for a woman who had a glass eye. And he didn't want to limit God by saying it can't happen. You got a glass eye. So he just prayed for her. And she started having pain. And so he just kept praying for her. And over 20 or 30 minutes, his pain got so intense that her glass eye popped out and she had an eyeball under there. Man, that's awesome. All things are possible to him that believes. And if you say, I can't believe that, then you need to say, God, forgive me for my unbelief. Man, we, we are expecting great miracles. So I want to start today by saying that if you have a need of healing in your body, I want you to stand where you are and I'm going to lead you in a prayer and we're going to talk. We're going to start using our power and authority and we are going to speak to these sicknesses and diseases. If you're in a wheelchair, man, raise your hand. Do something. Do what you can do. And praise God, we're going to believe God for a miracle. But I want you to quit approaching God as a beggar, begging for a healing. It's the children's bread. It belongs to you. This is your right by inheritance. And you need to take your authority and speak to whatever it is that is dominating you. Now, I'm going to lead us in prayer, but you won't offend me a bit if you talk out loud. You got to say something with your mouth. Amen. And you talk. You say pain, leave. If you know how to, if you know the name of whatever it is, you call it by name. You speak what you are believing for, not what you feel, not what you've been told. Amen. Amen. So, Father, right now, we just act on the word that you're, you've given us. Thank you for this example. Thank you for Jesus showing us how to release this supernatural authority and power. So right now, in the name of Jesus, we speak to whatever it is that is hurting, that is not functioning properly, anything that's out of alignment, anything that's wrong, 
We speak to cancer, to heart problems, to disease, to sugar diabetes, to hearing problems, eye problems, throat problems, teeth, anything. Father, we just speak in the name of Jesus. We command you to line up with the Word of God. We take this authority and speak right now, and bodies, you respond in the name of Jesus. We command you to be healed right now. And you believe that God is releasing that power, and you begin to rejoice right now and thank God. Begin to start thanking God that whatever's happened. Praise God. Praise God the way you would if you could verify and if the doctor proved that you were healed. Thank him for your healing. Father, we believe the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us. And that that resurrection power is now coming out of our mouth. Death and life are in the power of our tongue and we just release this healing right now. We command all kinds of pains to be gone. Praise God. Man, lots of people being healed of pain. You've already been healed, but it's manifesting. Here's the healing power of God right now. Headaches and things are gone in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. Stomach problems, bowel problems are being healed right now in the name of Jesus. Command all of that pain to be gone. Somebody that hasn't been able to sleep, insomnia. You just have struggled with sleep. You're healed right now. Talk to your body and say, body, you're healed. You're over this. You can sleep like a baby. Wake up every two hours crying. No, that's not. We aren't saying that. <laughs> Father, we just thank you that we can sleep. We are healed. Man, here's lung problems. Esophagus, herniated esophagus. Right now healed. Uh, uh, acid reflux and all those kind of things are healed right now in the name of Jesus. Joints are being healed. Man, you just talk to whatever it is that you need right now. Body, you are healed. Eyes, you are healed. Perfect vision. 2020 vision. Perfect vision. In Jesus' name. Perfect hearing in the name of Jesus. Jesus. All ringing noise in the ears. We command it to stop right now. Be gone in Jesus' name. Heart, you work properly. Veins, arteries, you are healed. Any of this blockage in our arteries or veins, we just speak healing. We rebuke curses that have been spoken over us, hereditary things. We rebuke all of those curses. We've got the blood of Jesus flowing in us. And the curse of our fathers is not going to come upon us. Father, we thank you that we are healed. We receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Man, all kinds of things. I believe all.